All right, let's get started. Thank you all for joining us today, our uh, October 1st Friday's webinar. Please feel free to use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screens to ask any questions you have for Patrick, and we can address those throughout the program or at the end of his presentation. Our speaker today is Patrick Benner, who has been at the university since 2001 when he started as an area coordinator after completing his degrees in counseling and higher education at Old Dominion University. Patrick now serves as the Director of Residence Life and Housing. In his time at Richmond, Patrick has advised many groups that include living learning programs such as Spinning Your Web and RC Extreme. Patrick was responsible for the development of the first year living learning programs, RC Art Start, Explore Your World, Our Business, and, and the Appalachian Trail Challenge, where he led 18 Richmond College students 40 miles in just two days. Patrick also co-led the development of the Live Learn Lakeview, which became today's Sophomore Scholars in Residence program. This year, Patrick and the Residence Life and Housing team have been instrumental in the planning, reopening, and support efforts for our students. When he's not on campus, you can usually find Patrick hanging out with his Great Dane, Hazel, in his backyard. Without anything further from me, let's hear from our speaker, Patrick Benner. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be with you. Uh, I, when we switch and I get rid of my screen share, hopefully I'll be able to see some of your faces. Um, but thank you all for joining us this morning and inviting me to speak and share some information about um, what's been going on in our neck of the woods, what's going on on campus, uh, and some of the great things that um, our team here in Residence Life and Housing has done um, in the last few years, but more importantly, in the last seven months to get things you know, up, ready, and started for our campus community to come back and return um, this August. So without further ado, I'm gonna, I will jump through some of my slides and if there are questions that do come up, I will be prompted. So please put them in the chat and um, when there's a good point for a pause, I can uh, certainly answer those as we move through things. Um, you've already heard a little bit about um, my introduction here, but um, I've been at the university now. I'm going my 19th year. It's, uh, it's been quite something. I've enjoyed all of my time here and being here and being a part of this you know, Richmond community, this fighter community. As was mentioned, I started as an area coordinator here um, at the University of Richmond College. I was one of the live-in staff members. And I'm not sure if my, my old good friend, Evan Baum, is you know, in the group right now, but I'll check later. I saw him on the list. He actually was one of the RAs that um, was in the interview group that interviewed me back in 2001 um, when I first started here. So that was uh, interesting to see and good to see his name on the list if he's joining us. And then I transitioned through you know, several positions here at the university um, as things you know, progressed and changed for me professionally and also at the institution um, from being a coordinator of recruitment selection with Richmond College, the assistant dean, then the associate dean for residence life, and then I, when we were in a transition period, um, I was the acting associate dean for residence life with West Hampton College. And that was all occurring in um, summer and fall of 2016. Um, and so when things you know, shifted, then we merged the offices, which I will get to. Um, I became the director of residence life and undergraduate student housing, um, but now the director of residence life and housing as we've, we've adjusted our um, our office and what we do because now we are we work to house a few graduate students you know because we do have some graduate student athletes and we also um, took on the housing of our law school students um, which used to be maintained and done completely separate by the law school so our office um, came together and I'm gonna try to shrink my corner screen here sorry um, in November 2017 so the fall sorry I take a step back to late summer and fall of 2017 is when we um, started to bring some things together and have some discussions because there were some interim things going on. And the Board of Trustees approved the new office to combine Richmond College and West Hampton College Residence Life programs along with the Office of Undergraduate Student Housing. And so through that, um, that spring of 2018, the summer of 2018, we finished the 2017-2018 academic year. 
still working as three independent um, entities, but you know, um, under the guidance of us all, you know, working together as one big team. And then we really did a lot of planning, organizing, restructuring. We called them our buckets, you know, over that spring and summer. We pulled in, you know, professional staff from within our department, outside our department, and our student staff, our residence life and head residents to really look at, you know, how do we want to bring ourselves together? What are the key things that make us, you know, residence life and housing to be one unit, one team and to bring all those things together. So we did a lot of work in that area and it was great to get, you know, those things squared away and have our student give us a lot of feedback of what they had seen in the past and what they thought we could do moving forward um, as one team. And one of the big things that we, you know, developed was our mission, values, and vision. And we needed to have this as like our, our launch point. And so our biggest, you know, our biggest thing that we wanted to kind of bring together and have everything rolling around is what, what was going to be our mission, you know, and our mission, you know, is, you know, very easy to understand, but the big key elements are fostering community, focusing on that individual student, celebrating that individual student, um, and having that development of that individual student, which has always been something that has been um, just important, you know, just in my background with counseling, but, you know, really working with that individual um, to kind of foster everything else that they have, you know, as far as personal growth and, you know, the development and embracing inclusion within our residential spaces and that responsible leadership, um, you know, within our community as well. Our values, um, we built them around four main pillars, community, connections, inclusivity, and support. Um, when we were going through our buckets and thinking through what are our main areas, this, these kept rising to the top inevitably and you know, without fail. And so our main focus was to develop that community, to build those connections with our students amongst their peers, faculty and staff, provide those opportunities for them and cultivate that environment of inclusivity where we have respect, empathy and value for all of our residents and all of our members in our community, um, as well as fostering that atmosphere of support. You know, we do a lot of things in the area of support that you all hear from a lot of our colleagues around campus um, that we're interconnected with through student development, whether it's CAPS, student health, our wellness and well-being, but also um, many of our partners in CSI, um, living and learning, as well as our academic skills center. And a lot of those things are connected, you know, through efforts within our office, within the residence halls, through buildings, through programs, and things of that nature. And then our vision, um, the biggest thing we put here is that we wanted to be, you know, the progressive leaders. Like, and that is kind of our key component in this in creating that sense of the spider community, we want to keep moving forward. We want to keep um, on the cutting edge. We want to stay ahead with our students. What are their needs? What are their needs going to be in five years, seven years, 10 years, whether it's, you know, adjusting things within our residential spaces, you know, from um, our housing stock to looking at things more programmatically um, from a, a, a student support, you know, ratio. So it is always in the back of our mind of how we can keep moving forward and keep you know, being on the new and advanced and providing the services for our students that we know that they are wanting, that they're seeking. Um, when we're looking at our high school students that are, you know, looking to come to Richmond in two and three years, what are they experiencing now? And what can we put in place that will be here and ready for them when they, you know, do join our spider community? Our team is, it, it's, a, it's a lovely team. I, I can't be happier with, um, you know, the team that we have in place. We are a very robust group. Um, we have 93 resident assistants and head residents um, all over our campus. Um, we house um, just under 2880 students on campus and we're at full capacity. And for all of you that know, the typical annual enrollment at the University of Richmond hovers right around 3100. So, we're looking at the ability to, you know, have the capacity of housing 95% of our students on campus at any point in time. And so it, the, the residential experience is a very key component. And so to have a very strong staff, a great team in place to be able to provide the support for our students is phenomenal. We also are five live-in area coordinators. Um, these are all um, masters um, completed individuals that have gone, you know, through their bachelor's degree, through their master's degree, and they're in the fields related to higher education and have worked um, within student affairs, student development, or residence life and housing at another institution, you know, before coming here. And we did some restructuring um, this past summer when we had some 
some changes amidst all things COVID. We did some restructuring, which was, you know, and also another thing to, you know, work through as we, um, you know, made some adjustments somewhere just for the betterment of our office team and our support for our students. We now have an assistant director for housing um, who has uh, joined us and their primary focus is all things housing, working with our facility staff and, you know, making sure that things are going as they should be with all of our residential areas. And then we have an associate director for residence life and housing that oversees more of the residence life aspects of um, within the office um, to kind of get things going with our student staff and our residence life staff and our college fellows program. And we'd be remiss, you know, not to have our like most important team member, our administrative coordinator, Jocelyn, who works in our office and actually started with us um, in fall of last year as well. But it's been uh, it's great to have such you know strong representation and a great team and great support to keep things moving forward for us. I'm gonna take a sip of water real quick. Um, so just a little, um, I call it the bricks and mortar. You probably, you may have heard this um, just from other things. I just call it a little bricks and mortar for you, just to give you an idea of, you know, some of the things that, you know, go on on campus to put things in perspective with what things look like on this campus now, if you haven't been here in a while, but, you know, looking at the landscape, you know, roughly half of all the buildings and structures on campus are residential. There's approximately, you know, in the low, um, low 80s of all buildings and structures on campus and um, just over 40 of them are residential. Um, and so that is, that's a huge footprint on this campus. Um, and it's a lot to, you know, um, keep up with and maintain. And we work very closely with our partners in uh, university facilities and services. We do what's called um, facility condition assessments on an annual basis, but we do long-term reports we're looking at things from a five-year basis and a 10-year basis of you know what is their lifespan how do we keep them in a cycle so that our buildings are staying fresh and that we're doing all the right things to keep you know our buildings looking as good as they can replacing furniture things of that nature and then we do um, a lot of planning and prioritization with our projects um, each fall we go through a planning phase where we look at you know the room and board costs you know for each calendar year, what it might be projected for the next year in comparison, you know, with our, our top 10 competitor schools from an admission standpoint, what are they doing? And uh, we are actually uh, well underneath all of their, you know, flat rate room and boards for their entering first years. And we've uh, continuing to do that, which has been, you know, a welcoming thing for our students who come here. And it still allows us to put projects on the table and do things um, that allow us to, you know, keep our residence halls looking the way we want them to be, not going down the modern path that a lot of institutions are doing with, you know, privatized housing and things of that nature where they are looking at more modernized buildings and things just aren't fitting the mold. We have a very, we have a very great look, you know, here at the University of Richmond. So when we do our renovations, we are maintaining the bones of our building. We are maintaining the external structures and facades of our building so that everything still has this wonderful appeal, this matching appeal, this gothic appeal. So when we even do new builds, it's, it's a very different project for us to get the age brick, the different stone, the different castmate windows. Um, but it's very important, you know, to, you know, how we're looking at things from an architectural standpoint, but also just from a visual standpoint. And we just, in case you haven't heard, which I'm sure you all heard, and I give huge kudos to our, um, our staff and facilities and grounds for being the number one most beautiful campus, um, you know, that was rated by the Princeton Review. So again, it goes to a lot of that. We want to keep things, you know, looking the way, you know, Richmond is. Um, we've done a lot of new, um, new builds, renovations, and projects and improvements um, through the years. Um, we started what was called the Housing Redevelopment Plan in roughly 2006, which was like, we call it like the Housing Redevelopment Plan. 1.0 and then we started a 2.0 project, I would say probably around 2012 as we started to kind of, you know, mold and do a few more things in a very quick fashion. But we've done, you know, new builds throughout the years to include Lakeview, West Hampton Hall, and the Gateway Village Apartments, um, a lot of major renovation projects, full building renovation projects and improvements within Freeman Hall, our most historic buildings in Jeter Hall, Thomas Hall, and North Court. Um, those were just phenomenal jobs done um, to keep uh, the, the buildings looking as beautiful as they are and to maintain, you know, the historical preservation. Um, the University Forest, you know, apartment blocks that, you know, when they were first built with us were said they were only to be a temporary structure and we brought in Gateway. We removed, you know, five of the blocks, but 
we uh, we have we've done some full renovations with the 16 remaining, and they are doing extremely well. We did internal, external roofing, um, you know, you name it to get those things, um, you know, looking a lot better than they used to do um, in the days that uh, that they used to see a lot of, I should say, um, friendly wear and tear. Um, and we've done some major renovations in South Court, Gray Court, and most recently in Laurel Robbins Court. Um, as uh, in summer of 20, uh, summer of 2019 was our last project there. And through the years um, with our renovations and uh, you know extensive building upgrades in Marsh Hall, Moore Hall, Dennis Hall, and then we started Robbins Hall, we did part one. We would, with these projects, we split over two summers so that we don't take them offline during the year, but we had to you know pause on part two of Robbins Hall in the summer of 2020 um, due to all things COVID, but we are, hoping to get that back on the docket for summer of 21, along with our, our last, you know, real building that would need to be um, renovated or get some extensive upgrades, which would be Wood Hall. So our hope is to get that all wrapped up in summer of 21. So, and along the lines, like I mentioned with the facility condition assessments, you know, the main things we keep an eye on um, for our students for comfort, fall in the area of furniture, flooring, wireless locks, our clean air systems and our lighting. I, the two I will highlight here are the flooring and our clean air systems. Um, we, like most institutions, I should say, unlike most institutions, we don't have, you know, shared air, pushed air, full building, you know, air conditioning or heat systems. We have individual fan cool units in all of our residential spaces, which is actually key for us this year in preparation for all things COVID. And I'll explain that later. But another thing that we've moved away from that some schools are starting to do is the flooring aspect. We've, we're moving away from carpet altogether just because it presents, you know, things like allergens and all sorts of things can be tracked into carpet that are impossible to get out. Um, so we've gone with some hard surface flooring, whether it's tile or wood laminate, and the students are really enjoying kind of the warmer feeling of that um, within their spaces and they want to bring their own area rugs, they're more than welcome to. And that's been a, a really welcome thing just from all things health and well-being as well. So some of the things I would say that, you know, makes us unique um, are some of the things that you all know and you've heard throughout the years. Um, you've heard the Richmond experience and I, I am a huge proponent of calling it the, the Richmond residential experience because you really can't have the overall Richmond experience unless you are, you know, a part of the residential community because it is such a huge piece of life on this campus. And as I said to the students when they came back in August, when we, when we hit the break in March until seeing students start to come back in August, it just really breathes life back into this campus and just seeing the students was just an amazing thing. Um, so that that overall experience of living on campus and having that interconnection with the curricular and co-curricular is just a, a phenomenal feat that makes us truly unique by having this small intimate community on our campus. Um, our community development model is you know really focused on that individual and where we focus on a lot of things in our programming areas with our first year experience and a lot of our programming is focused on the community development aspects, academic development, personal wellness and growth as well as inclusivity. Um, and it's just it's just a great thing for us to kind of keep things connected with our students on the floor in the in the community and that connection to the curricular um, model. We've had the college fellows program in place since 1991 and when we brought the two offices together, Residence Life within Richmond College, West Hampton College, it was a rejuvenation, a rebolstering of, you know, that's that group of, you know, 11 faculty to keep them going, keep them engaged with our students in the residence halls. And we have different levels of faculty engagement within our residential spaces with the new Endeavor program for our first year students. It's now in year three where we house those students as a cohort and work very closely with our sophomore scholar and residents, um, our Office of Living, Learning and Roadmap, excuse me, as well as our sophomore scholar residents now we house those students in a cohort on campus so they can work together they can live together they can uh, philosophize you know talk about you know what they're learning in class make interconnections with their um, various curriculum and their faculty coming into the residence to have those conversations it's just a very it's just a very intimate setting a very unique setting that just does not occur on a lot of campuses and another thing that we have that is actually an envy of a lot of schools is we have live in college fellows. Uh, we have four faculty that live on campus, that live within residence, that live within our residence halls, um, that have their families, you know, also on campus at times. And, you know, the students see that and they just, it's, it's just, it's, just a, it's a great thing to have. It makes the, the experience extremely unique um, for our students. 
Um, and we presented on it actually in a Google I conference on, um, on curricular last fall. And it was something that we received a lot of feedback from and questions from a lot of institutions on how they might try to institute that as well in the future. Something that we started more recently also with the development of the, the new office is we used to have separate, you know, um, surveys that would go out by the colleges and also by um, housing as well as our graduating senior surveys from polls to see what the student's experience has been like, you know, living in the residence hall, living on campus, what is their feedback? And so we started to bring all that survey feedback together three years ago and we developed a new um, institutional survey with our institutional effectiveness office and we ran those numbers over the last three years and so now we have a three-year aggregate which is great for us to look at and the overall satisfaction of our students is you know our three-year average right now is 89.7 i really want to get it to the above 90 and so one of the things that we you know decided on was to really engage a lot more of our students in conversations outside of the normal um, already established, you know, student governance groups to bring together um, students who live within the residence halls that really want to, you know, have a deeper dive conversation about what their experience is, whether it is things dealing with facilities or whether it's external matters that are connected to their experience within the residence halls, whether it's, you know, support, um, additional things working with dining um, or like just services that could be provided within the residential spaces. And that's going extremely well. We're actually um, in our year two of it. We have um, 15 members and we just met this past Monday nights and now we have broken into subgroups and they're ready and excited to kind of dive into tasks and um, pull in some outside people, other offices to have those conversations, to be able to provide that feedback that we can then take back to um, for projects and planning and prioritization to have that feedback versus it being um, Persons like myself saying, this is what I think the students want. You know, now we're really getting a lot of meat and potatoes from the students up front. So the last seven months, all right, before I dive into this one, I think I'll have to take a water break. And Patrick, just to let you know, mm -hmm. uh, Evan is tuning in, so. Great, all right, Evan, it's good so to hear from you. Good to see, I'll hope I'll see you in a few minutes when I stop sharing the screen. Um, so the last seven months have been absolutely something, but they've been something for everybody everywhere. Um, you know, from you know, the spiders that are all over the United States, but also our, our students and our population of students that are um, international, um, just working with, you know, students. As soon as we made this pivot to remote, just one funny story. I just, for those that know me that are on this call already, know that I probably have had sleepless nights and I've had, you know, some many nights where I've been awake at three, four in the morning. And I was actually in a dialogue with a student from China over room selection process. Um, and they were astonished that I was awake at three in the morning, but that was kind of the norm for me in March and April. So that was okay. Um, but when we made this pivot to, you know, remote in March, it really, you know, kind of, it shook things, it shook things everywhere. And you know, we had to make a quick decision over spring break, um, you know, for the safety of our students, the safety of our campus. And, you know, we allowed students to come back over a period of three days to get as many belongings as they wanted to get because we were hoping that it, we would only do a, a, a small hiatus, a small pivot to remote, and then we'd be able to return. But then as we all knew, the numbers changed daily, quickly, astronomically, and we had to make the hard decision to go full remote for the remainder of the spring semester. And also in doing so, not allow students to come back to campus you know, for risk of travel, transmission, things of that nature, to be able to get their belongings. And so that became a very bit difficult thing to work through and manage. And we understand that it was just something that was hard for students, families, and, you know, the spider community everywhere. So our focus shifted then, you know, is, is providing as much support, you know, remotely to our students, to our various offices of student development. But for us, it was a focus on the students that remained on campus. And initially we had um, just over 340 students that you know, remained on campus, um, either because of travel concerns, home health concerns, you know, international um, status, or just not having you know, a, a safe place to you know, go home to um, with some of our students that are, you know, um, that just don't have the environment that would have been supportive for them to return home. And so once we started seeing numbers increasing in the area, we also had to make a, a decision on how we can support students to get home. And through, through the help of, you know, Spiders Helping Spiders, we had to um, 
we worked with a lot of students to um, provide them, you know, financial assistance to get them home, to get them, you know, to what they needed to also provide them with, you know, technology equipment, whether it was laptops, Wi-Fi, you name it, um, for students, you know, in all sorts of areas in the United States, but also internationally. I know we were providing, you know, Wi-Fi and hotspots for students that were international that did not have it um, in the area in which they lived. And so that was a huge thing from a, a support standpoint from Spiders Helping Spiders and that the donations that came in from that from, you know, great alums like yourself to help with that process. Um, then we started our, our staggered move out process. Once we were able to um, find a very safe and comfortable um, time frame with all things uh, under the guidance of the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health, we started a staggered move out process which lasted four weeks. Um, and it was done in a very extended process to ensure safety. And I was very proud of how it worked out while it was a long process. And I know it, you know, um, caused some scheduling issues with students and families. It was one that we wanted to ensure safety and we made it through that entire process without any concerns for um, close contacts, transmissions, or anything. So that was a very successful thing for us to get through um, and to work with the students and families, you know, to get that process to move all students out in a staggered period. Was just, it was just something to do over time slots, daily check-ins, monitoring, and things of that nature. So it was a huge thing for us to undertake, and I was very glad and like appreciative of the students and families when they came to campus and how they you know, work with us to make sure everything was um, safe and working as well as it could. Then we started all things planning. This is where the extensive planning, um, you know, kicked in. I don't even, I can't even recite to you the numbers of committees, groups, subgroups, or whatever they um, <laughs> ended up being titled in all honesty, um, to that uh, we were pulled into, tapped into, and that I was a part of, my staff was a part of, to really start diving into a lot of the things of how we were going to get things prepared this summer and you know to even potentially open for summer in some capacity if we were or if we didn't how we were going to make things ready open available for all things um, fall and so there was a lot of work that went into this and there's a lot of work that i hope you know when we did kind of our worst case scenario um, planning too i hope all those plans and folders stay on my shelf and just continue to collect dust. Um, but we've done a lot of contingency planning for if we ever had like a worst case scenario, we had to plan for um, things for a future pivot to remote and stuff like that. So we've done a lot in that area. But I would say some of the biggest ones that we've done, um, as you all have seen and you've you know heard through the information that's shared through the, the mailings that have gone out and the stuff on the internet, our isolation and quarantine, the modular units, and I'll show a video here later about this, this was a this is a huge undertaking. When we first sat down, this was April, late April, early May, before we even got through the move out process, we started talking about how are we going to isolate and quarantine under the new regulations by the CDC and the VDH. Um, and so we started exploring all sorts of options. Do we go down the hotel path? Do we rent a hotel? Do we buy a hotel? Do we clear out our residential spaces? Do we go with all singles across campus? Do we shut down residence halls? Do we force students off campus? A lot of things had to be thought through and we wanted to think through what was the best way for Richmond. You know, a lot of schools were doing a lot of things that, you know, some schools were following, everyone thought was the right thing to do and it may have been the right thing for them. But in the end, after us, you know, going through a lot of conversations with the VDH and hearing the guidance from the CDC and talking with an immunologist that we worked with, very closely from VCU through our, um, our contingency planning and our resiliency team planning, we decided to keep all of our students, you know, in residence on campus, not go to singles. We did do some adjustments in our buildings. We eliminated all triples on campus. So every triple became a double room and even some of our smaller double rooms. Um, we, you know, if we could not, you know, map out the room to be appropriately physically distanced for two individuals to be able to sleep six feet apart, study six feet apart um, with the furniture in the room. We just went ahead and made those rooms singles. And so we had some adjustment in that area and the students that were impacted with that work with us and it was great. And so we're very appreciative of them for that. Um, but what we were thinking through was how can we isolate and quarantine students on our campus if we're not going to eliminate more spaces on our, our, our university, um, our housing stock. And so 
we started thinking through options and immediately it popped into our mind between myself and Paul Lozo, who is a, one of our directors of our facilities, what we should start looking at modular units. And I think some people shook their head at us the first time we brought it up, but then once we started exploring it and showing some different styles and options, um, people really kind of took to it. And, you know, we started working through some of the logistics and, um, it was it was a huge undertaking. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. This was it's like it's like building a city within a city. So we have if, once you come to campus and you see this, um, you know these structures, you'll understand how extensive it was for us to get, you know, not just delivering these units on campus, but to build in generators, to build in um, electrical lines, to put in new sewage and plumbing and pump stations and you name it. It just was like, it just was a major undertaking for us to get through, um, which has been great. Um, we did start seeing some reductions in students who wanted to live on campus, who wanted to move off, and so it did allow us to plan for some additional contingency spaces within our residential areas. So we did take um, Atlantic and Pacific houses as well as Col Keller Hall offline because those are our smaller residential areas, and we shifted those students into some of our more centrally located housing um, on the Richmond College side and West Hampton College side. So that gave us a lot more spaces to use for isolation and quarantine as well. So it increased our percentage because when we worked with the immunologist, it was to get a 5% number and we're actually above a 10% number, which is um, a great thing for us to have in our back pocket in, if and when we have to utilize these spaces. Another major thing that was done, I would say, for our buildings was the upgrades um, working with facilities. We installed UVC filters and bipolar ionizations. We installed them in all of our air handling units and there it's just, it. in addition to our clean air systems, it, it just eliminates bacteria, it kills bacteria, and has been a blessing for our entire campus. It's in all of our academic buildings and administrative buildings too. And that's, you know, been something that is, you know, you never see it, but it's probably one of the most important things that we did, you know, to uh, for the health and well-being of all of our students and faculty and staff on campus. The adjustments within our red phase, we did have to make some adjustments, you know, with our residential spaces and our, our students, you know, we have traffic flow patterns within our buildings. You know, we have stairwells that are up, down, we have limitations in our lounges, we have limitations for guests, visitors, and things of that nature, and the students are really, you know, adjusting to that well, and they're adhering to that, and they're, they're understanding kind of what is their own internal bubble within the Richmond, you know, bubble that we have, uh, which I'm very glad we have a Richmond bubble right now from a standpoint of our students, you know, maintaining, like, a healthy lifestyle and things of that nature. And right now, um, some of our, our main focus and my main focus and our team's main focus is our isolation and quarantine case management and support for students team. Um, this is where we are working with any student right now that you know is uh, symptomatic and working with our student health center staff um, to place and locate these students and get them moved to an isolation or quarantine unit and to provide them with the, the support that they need. We're connecting with these students through our dining, our student health center, our dean's office from an academic standpoint caps from a mental health support standpoint, but we're also just involving others and in a lot of things that have, you know, populated through this that we didn't think that we were going to be, you know, it was just, you thought about a lot of things when it came to support, but, you know, students still receive Amazon packages and I, I, I kind of had some fun with this. We go to deliver students packages to their rooms. We also take a picture of it and email it to them like as if they were receiving their Amazon package at home. Um, just to kind of bring you know a little more smiles to the, to the students faces and helping with the all the things that they are having to endure right now and working with our our, our wellness staff to you know provide extra support um, for you know online um, uh, counseling as well as group sessions as well as um, meditation relaxation zen programs and online fitness classes that um, students that are in quarantine and are asymptomatic can take those courses, you know, remotely in their own space, which has been um, a welcome thing by our students. And so, um, kind of getting closer to the end of my um, my talking here to be able to give you all time to ask some questions. Some of the other big things that um, um, I've been a part of, and we are really kind of staying on top of things here, is we have what is known as our rapid response team. It's a team that I'm a part of with about six or seven other individuals where if we have a report or a concern of a, a, a known close contact or a positive test, um, 
that has um, the impact or the need for us to bring the rapid response team together to be able to mobilize in a very quick fashion if we were to have to do some adjustments in a building or um, shift a classroom or move more students. We have this team in place and it's been working phenomenally well. We have only had to call it a few times and I will say from the team and the response um, working with them, it's chaired by Shannon Sinclair. Um, it's, been, it's been an amazing team that we've put together and it's been allowing us to mobilize things in a very fast fashion um, because we know the first, you know, really 12 to 24 hours, that crucial period where we need to identify um, anything within that first 48 hour, hour period from a close contact standpoint. So it's been something that we've been able to mobilize as a small institution that's been working extremely well. Um, prevalence testing is also something that we have started up and, um, and I have to take a step back because I forgot to mention this, our whole move-in process um, we utilized the Robin Stadium to test all of our students upon arrival. Not a lot of schools um, did this. We did the, the PCR test on site. Um, when I was talking to my college around the state. None of them thought about doing that until almost the beginning of August. And so they started to do mailing tests, but we did ours upon arrival and we're still continuing to do it. Um, right now, um, in the last two um, rounds, we do it every two weeks. We've tested 10% of our student population. And all those results have come back negative, which has been phenomenal. Our students are still maintaining and um, being very healthy. We're actually going to be increasing that number up to 15% to do a higher percentage of prevalence testing within our students, but also within our faculty and staff um, population as well. So that higher percentage is going to start in our next round of testing starting next Tuesday. Um, and we're still continuing to do this on a weekly basis. And it is something that is mandatory and the students are very welcome to it because they want to get tested and to get, go through this and it's a it's a very helpful thing for us to monitor things within our community we've also in, put in place interim student conduct policies and one thing that we are actually um you know starting to work through um is kind of a, 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 a responsible action protocol of students to you know if they come forward and um, on their own volition and they are honest and truthful and forthcoming in a very timely fashion about you know their close contacts or you know um, being in uh, testing positive or being at an event where they know there was a concern for covid um, we're working through those interim policies as well to be able to to provide support for those students versus all of a sudden turning and saying now you're responsible for a violation if they come forward in their own volition we're working with those students because we want students to come forward we've actually had a situation where we did have a group of students come forward and that was something that you know was phenomenal to see our students say hey this happened here's what we did here's who was involved and we were able to act very swiftly and quickly so i really do applaud our students for the work that they're doing and the things they're doing to keep our entire campus community safe and before I end my presentation, I'm going to try to see if this hyperlink is going to work. If it doesn't, are y'all still seeing my screen? We are. Okay. So see, um, still your slide. All right. Oh, you still see my slide? Yes. All right. So let me, it didn't shift. Let me stop share and then I'll reshare. I'm going to show you all a video that I'm sure you all have probably already seen because as my wife keeps saying the number of hits keep going up and up and my friends keep texting me saying Patrick I'm tired of seeing you on television so um, without further ado here is a video that was done by our communications office about our isolation and quarantine um, preparation um, so and as soon as we get done with this I will break and we'll start with some questions We aren't hearing audio, just. So Patrick, we can't hear the um, audio coming through. Okay. Let me see the video, but. If we can't get it, no worries at all. We can um, send it out to everybody after this. So it, it would be great all right. for them I to even take a look at your website too, see what's going on. So that should all be right. good. We've had, we'll stop that. We have a couple questions. Um, right. And I know you touched on it a little bit, um, 
but if off the top of your head, if you have a rough estimate of how many students chose to return to live on campus and how many are engaging in virtual learning um, remotely from home or wherever they might be this semester. Oh, goodness. Um, so what I will say is right now um, on campus, we are at 81% occupancy. So we have about 2,350 students living on campus. We know that we have a higher off-campus population um, you know, right now, and in large part that is due to um, all things study abroad um, being canceled and the students that, you know, were to study abroad, um, you know, made the decision to just find locations and housing off campus. And then we did have some other students who, you know, from their own mindset just thought that they would want to live in an apartment off campus and commute in. I would say, um, don't hold me to this, but the remote numbers I think are about 400. Um, I know this was um, put in a recent Collegian article and I can go back and find it. Um, but uh, it is, it's something that we put together um, pretty quickly to allow students to go remote for the fall semester. And we're actually going to be um, offering that option again for students in the spring and information is going to come out about that next week. Awesome. Thank you. And then we have another question. So I've been tracking the COVID dashboard and have been really impressed with how low numbers are. Honestly, it seems like the safest place in RVA. It appears largely students are really taking this seriously and being incredibly responsible. Can you talk a little more about the resiliency of our students and how they are doing? Yeah, I will. Um, that, I think that's an, um, like the best word, you know, to describe it. I think our students um, are learning to be a lot more resilient. I think just like most people and the, the situation in the world we're in right now, um, people are adapting and becoming a lot more resilient than, you know, they may have been seven months ago. Um, I think our students are supporting one another immensely. Um, like, there's not a time where I'm on campus, walking around campus or going to and from. I still call it the peer. So for those of you that remember it as being called the peer and not Tyler's, I still call it the peer. The students are in there all the time, talking with each other, supporting one another, having lunch with one another, um, and just seeing students around campus. Um, you know, just you know, just also this week there was um, an equity summit that was put together by our student leaders, and to see those students, you know, sharing openly in dialogues Tuesday night and last night about their experiences, just as you know, students, you know, as persons, um, has been phenomenal. But to have them also walk through and talk through the things that are going on in and out of their classrooms, working with their faculty, you know, being masked up in a classroom for an hour and 15 minutes, and then, you know, going to and from their other areas, they're being extremely responsible. Um, I am very grateful for all that they are doing. The students that are stepping up and, you know, uh, reporting other students, the students that are also just kind of you know, talking to other students about what's the appropriate thing to do, what's the right thing to do is just great. And they're supporting each other in a lot of ways um, too. Like there's a lot of our students that are seeking, you know, support through our counseling and psychological services. But I think also in this, in this, this time frame with the students who have their roommates and that's their, their smaller bubble is their roommate, but also their suite mate. So they're, they're few friends that, you know, they do invite into their space because they want to keep their bubble small. They're really utilizing those individuals as their support group. And it is, it's been something that um, I have seen like the benefits of from a developmental standpoint and more importantly, as someone mentioned, the resiliency standpoint. Awesome, thank you. And another question kind of naturally fits onto that. Um, what are you doing for your own mental health during this challenging time? Um, and does your role allow you to find time to disconnect from work when you need it? Um, well, today is a Friday, and I used to not say Happy Friday until I could actually say it again, you know, so the weekends are a lot more calm for me, um, which is good. Um, so I do, I do find my respite on weekends and as much as possible in the evenings. Um, I do, I, I am a, a huge dog lover. I have my Great Dane, but I also do goof off with my stepson Holden as much as we possibly can, what we can do outside. And he's more of a video game guy than I am. So I just kind of watch and laugh. Um, um, but I definitely will be, you know, when, when the time is right and I can, you know, step away 
for more than a few days, I definitely will be seizing that opportunity. But I, I do as much as I can, you know, just to find balance, you know, just personal health care. I still, you know, take care of myself as much as I can. Um, for those, I, I still like to work out and do as much as I can during the day, you know, just to find that break um, when possible. Sure. Thank you. And we have another one. Um, oh. <laughs> I think I lost I'm, you. Yes, oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we have another question. So a few general housing questions. Um, mm -hmm. Are all dorms now co-ed? And are they co-ed by floor or by room? Are they? Um, are there any unair conditioned dorms remaining? September used to be very hot in Keller Hall. No, actually, I'll start with that. There are no unair conditioned buildings. Um, well, I know many of my colleagues around the state still have unair conditioned buildings. Um, and just uh, just as a fun fact for you all, uh, just Virginia Tech, 56% of their buildings are still unair conditioned. Um, but no, all of our buildings are fully um, air conditioned, and um, we we did transition to all of our first year residence halls being um, co-ed, but they are co-ed by floor, section, or pod. So the students are still living single gender by floor, section, or pod. Or the pods being in Laura Robbins. Um, so there's the single gender community within the larger um, co-educational um, community. Um, with Atlantic and Pacific offline this year, we don't have a designated all male or all female residence hall, which would be our Atlantic and Pacific halls. Um, but when those are online, there's one of those is designated as all male, one is designated as all female. And the shift for that has been um, over the last three years, just watching the numbers of our first year um, housing applications, fewer and fewer students were designated. They wanted single gender as an option. And when we had a building of 150 that was designated for single gender, but only 30 of the students that wanted single gender, we were running into a, a lot more dissatisfied, you know, students in that situation than, you know, the students who wanted it. So we, we found the best middle ground we could to have some larger hallways, because we do have some entire floors in a building where um, it's 70 people of, an, uh, of one gender. Great, and then one last final question. Um, you mentioned a bit about how important building community is to view our experience and specifically within residence halls. How are our RAs and area coordinators able to do this in our current state? Yes, it is, um, it's, it's, it's different, it's difficult, but I will say they have become extremely creative. Um, I'll tell you um, one amazing um, program that um, I won't say his full name, but Cameron put a, uh, a program together. Um, it was just this past Friday where it was a, a movie, virtual watching movie marathon, um, and they provided popcorn in every bag, separate, separate um, bags of popcorn in every lounge and um, laundry room for students to go and get if they wanted to pop them themselves and then start to tune in at different points of um, the Friday and Saturday for the movie marathon. But they're also doing things like um, providing mentorship um, between, you know, the upper class students that live in Lakeview with our first year students who live directly adjacent to them in Marsh Hall to have those connections from an upper class student to a first year student. Um, providing we're able to do small things um, indoors with like, you know, six to eight students in a lounge as well as being outdoors as much as possible. So they're getting very creative on how to do those things um, and connecting with other offices around campus um, to do any of the external programs. Because a lot of things that we've been working with also with um, CSI, we did a one major um, program to kind of kick the year off where it was a trivia contest where the buildings battled each other and it really built um, a community feel and an affinity for their building. And Laura Robbins ended up taking the high prize so they will soon get their, um, their reward, so. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, we've certainly learned a lot and all of us appreciate the time and effort your team have put in during these unprecedented times. It's been incredible. Um, and I thank all of our participants for joining us. I hope you'll save the dates for the rest of this semester's first Friday webinars. They will take place on uh, November 6th. 
and December 4th. And please remember to check out all the alumni Facebook, Instagram accounts, and the alumni website for additional information and exciting virtual events. We hope to see you soon and hope you're staying safe and healthy. Go Spiders. Take care.